get things started. Welcome to the June Sitecore User Group Meetup from Milwaukee. Um, how many of you guys are first timers? Nice. It keeps growing each and every time. Love seeing that. So uh, we have two great speakers today. Um, Phil Wickland is going to talk to us about personalization starting out of the gate. And Derek, one of the organizers of this group, is going to be talking about troubleshooting Sitecore. <laughs> so two really kind of key things that everyone asks for and everything that we got to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I'd like to thank Milwaukee Tool for giving us the place. Thank you very much. Would you like to say a few words from Milwaukee Tool? Coming up, Eric. My name is Eric O'Sullivan, and I don't have anything prepared, so I'm going to keep this short and hopefully not stupid. Um, I am the, I guess, what am I? Well, don't answer that. Project manager, um, agile apologist, maker of meetings, um, generally annoying person. Um, there's a number of people here that you can ask questions if you need to know anything about Milwaukee. Myself, Ryan and John are in back. Um, Nick is uh, hiding amongst you. Um, and we run the website and accounts and uh, basically web presence for the team. We do use Sitecore. We are mostly victims of it at this point. Um, but we are moving to greener pastures. Um, just wanted to say thanks for coming in. We've got swag bags in back because every geeky gathering I've ever been to loves swag bags. So if you, please feel free to help yourself and grab one. There's some cool stuff in there. If you don't, I'll just take them all home. Um, we do have uh, job openings in a couple of months, so please keep your eyes on, I don't know where you post those, like LinkedIn or MilwaukeeJobs.com. We'd love to have you come hang out with us. Uh, we have more fun than we ought to. Uh, this is at least my second beer today. So. What am I missing, John? Do you want to talk about anything specific or? Uh, well, perfect. Talk about greener pastures. So what he meant was we had a site built by a preceding team. Um, they have to manage it now. Teams. We're going to be burning the current site down because we've done basically wrong. We haven't been able to do the site where they make it available. And so the second half of the year, we're spending um, building a brand new site from scratch at 8.2. Um, so, the job is easy, you know, there's going to be real fun stuff. It's all brand new development. We're going to try and include as much as the has to offer. We've got here uh, the consultant now is up with South Cabello, and he's going to be helping us design the architecture for the new site. Um, and we also do that work that's, you know, we have a site for a lot of site for jobs that are very site core centric, and we've got applications that go well beyond the grocery aspect of the uh, you know, display website. We're going to show you. Um, Accounts and session management piece that also interacts with our mobile applications. Um, and uh, one key uh, tool tracking, stuff like that. You can look on the website to do a description of it. Um, and then there's some general apps that are actually involved under our platform as well. Yeah. Internal and external clients. We're very excited to move into things like personalization and persona building. So the presentations that we're looking at today are pretty exciting for us. Um, we also manage a bunch of websites around the world. I've got a call with Hong Kong at 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, John is super ultra besties with uh, our gentleman over in Australia, Australia New Zealand. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, I was with you when I started a year ago, but it's been real fun. Watch out, we have a, a site in you know, America with its own, its own products and its own pages, and we've been able to expand that into the Australian market, which has obviously different promotions, different products. Now we're going live in Asia the next month or so. Or, Two weeks ago, when I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you guys very much for coming. We appreciate All right, it. Cheers. thank you guys. Give them a round of applause. Okay, as everyone at pizza, we need to thank Paragon for the pizza today. Craig, just look them up and see if you are. Well, I hope it was good. It sounds like it was good. Um, my first meetup, and actually my first time up into this part of the country, and I had a great couple of days up here, so I spent some time in Madison. And Really love what you guys have to offer up here. So anyway, um, won't say too much. Paragon is a uh, Sitecore partner. Uh, we've been doing Sitecore work since 2008. It's all we do. Uh, we're not an agency, but we're more of a, a really a technical build shop. We've got 40 certified guys, and we do architecture all the way down to you know uh, the base level work. So anyway, that's it. Enjoy the rest of the night. All right. Without further ado, let's get uh, Mr. Paragon. <laughs> It's Phil. So everyone give a round of applause.
Well, thanks guys for having me. Uh, my name is Phil Wickland. I'm from Minneapolis, which is just a short hop and a skip uh, over here. I, I took that trip this afternoon and it was a beautiful drive. It's good to be standing. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> um, so I, I get to look forward to going back home tonight, uh, banging to my loud music and driving until 2 a.m. I can't wait. But uh, I do thank you for the opportunity to share. I, I love this topic. I love this topic because I think it's one of the most uh, important features of Sitecore. So when people buy Sitecore, you know, Sitecore does a great job of selling the platform, selling the potential of the platform. And one of the most uh, exciting and important features is personalization. Creating a experience that meets the wants and needs of every unique individual. That is kind of the, the panacea. See if I can get my clicker working so I can go through my slides. There we go. That was supposed to be a seamless transition there. Uh, not quite. Uh, but this is the goal, one-on-one right? -on -one marketing. We want to create an experience that's unique for each individual visitor. We want to know about them, learn about them, and let the experience respond to what we know, what behaviors they're exhibiting, what, we, what campaigns they've interacted from, what goals they've initiated. Uh, and so that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, I've kind of found that in my travels, uh, personalization is a somewhat abstract term. Uh, both of these are motorcycles, would you agree? Right? On the left we have a motorcycle, and on the right we have a motorcycle. They're both motorcycles, but they're very different things. And I think that's often the case with personalization, is we, we have very broad expectations for what it is, what it should do, and what it can do for us. I've found in my experience that most companies tend to live on the, the left side of the spectrum where personalization is this abstract concept and that we don't really quite know what it can do for our business. We know some neat kind of things that it could do, maybe swap out some imagery, swap out some styling, we, maybe somebody clicked a call to action and we're going to show another call to action, that kind of stuff. But there's really a, a depth of potential with this feature. And that's what I hope to communicate today, is what are the possibilities? Where can you take this platform? This is the reason you bought Sitecore, after all. Uh, there's a lot of free CMSs out there. You didn't buy Sitecore for a CMS, you bought it because you want to transform your digital experience with personalization, with customer journeys, those kinds of marketing automation capabilities. That's why you bought the tool. So what we got to do is find a way to you know, understand that big picture, understand that roadmap, as well as understand where do we start and how do we make progress. And so I hope today that I can leave you with a sense for what is the potential, but also how do you get started. Uh, so that's kind of the goal of the session. Uh, one example of this that I like to talk about, I was working with a bank, and this is a national bank. They have branches kind of all over. And their big idea for personalization was to, they wanted to create a local feel. So they're a big bank, but they wanted to feel like a local bank. So the opportunity, in their minds, was to uh, swap out the imagery on the homepage with GOIP location, right? So that you can show the Minneapolis skyline when you come from Minneapolis versus something else if you're from San Francisco. Right? And that's, a, that's an important personalization opportunity for that bank. They have this objective to feel like a local bank. And personalization can help meet that objective. But there's so much more that they could do. So for example, part of what I was trying to encourage them with or think about is what are you trying to sell? What are, you know, so this is a bank. Mortgages are a key uh, opportunity for them, a key selling point. That's probably where they make most of their money. And, but mortgages are a complex sale. So instead of just tweaking imagery, how can we understand where a user <coughs> is in that journey of buying a home? Can you make your site a destination for people to engage in content where you can learn about their, you know, where they're at in their journey and as a result personalize? So for example, what, a lot of the strategy stuff we talked about is what content could you put on your website that helped people in the home buying journey? And as they interact with that content, we're learning about where they're at in that journey. And as a result of where they're at, now we can personalize 
and with real meaningful personalization. We can understand if someone's looking for an agent, researching what, how do you, you know, what are good things about an agent, how to pick an agent, right? We can understand that. We could point them to agents that we know have a relationship with our bank, right? So you're, you're way at the front of the, the funnel and you're leading people down a path you're trying to get them to go down, which is to pick an agent that has a relationship with your bank so that you become part of their buying journey. That, to me, is impactful personalization. Now again, certainly changing the imagery creates an impact, but helping that user go down that journey to, <coughs> toward deeper engagement with your brand, that is where the power is, and I'll talk more about that today. So, objective, I kind of already talked about that for 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna start with the basics. Raise your hand if you've configured personalization yourself in Cycle. So four or five people. Raise your hand if you're a developer. Okay, 75% of people. Raise your hand if you're a marketer. Okay, so six or seven. So developers, are you super excited to learn about personalization? Are you? Okay, right, cool, all right. Because you have to have an open mind, because this is definitely, actually I have, I have one line of code. I have one line of code in my whole deck. So just get on the edge of your seat, it's coming. <laughs> uh, it'll blow your hair back, I promise, okay? I'll camp out on that one slide for a long time. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the basics. Uh, for you marketers in the room, you're gonna wanna know the basics, right? We, we have to know how to get started, we have to know how to configure this stuff. There's a lot you can do out of the box, I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna talk about persona mapping. To me, personas are the most foundational element uh, or deliverable in your personalization strategy. You have to know your users. Who are they? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? What behaviors do they exhibit? And as a result of knowing your users, you can personalize. So I'm gonna talk about how you can actually map those personas right into the platform so that over time, Sitecore learns which persona that user is. Uh, I'll talk about automated journeys, so marketing automation. We'll cover that a little bit. Testing. Testing is important, you wanna know the impact of your personalization. And then at the end, I'll wrap up with, okay, how do we get started? <clears throat> I wanna mention, I actually gave this presentation a few weeks ago, I apologize for not reskinning my deck, I figured you wouldn't care. Um, I went way over time. So, I cut out all the demos in today's talk. Now, if that disappoints you, I want to leave you my card, and I'd love to get on a phone call with you next week, and I can do the demos for you offline. Uh, I got kind of sucked into the demo vortex, and only got through like half of my content. So, I'm going to try to keep it at a higher level, and if, if you see anything and you want to know how do I do that, you know, show me the clicks, I'd love to get on a call with you next week, and uh, I, can, I can show you how the sausage is made, so to speak. Does that make sense? Hopefully that's not disappointing anybody. Um, but like, it's just such a big topic, I can't get through it all in, in 50 minutes. <clears throat> so a little bit more about me. I'm an independent consultant. Uh, my, my business name is Verdian Solutions. There's my Twitter handle. I'm a digital strategy MVP with Sitecore. I've wrote a couple books. I actually have a trunk full of books. So before the end of my session, I'm gonna try to figure out like a good question and whoever answers it right. I'll give a book to, because I can't get rid of these books fast enough. <laughs> you wouldn't think that'd be a problem, but uh, I, I don't speak at enough user groups to give them away. Uh, but, but I wrote one on kind of more the marketing side, uh, the strategy side, and then I also wrote uh, with my good friend, Jason Wilkerson, we wrote the dev book. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, so types of personalization. Now, I'm not really following the Sitecore official documentation here. This is just my observation of the landscape. I, I've identified that there are really three types of personalization you should know. The first one is rules-based. This is the most simplistic form of personalization. You've probably used it a lot already. It's basically the if this, then that kind of personalization. So, if they came from Minneapolis, show the Minneapolis skyline. If they clicked that call to action, show this other call to action. If they downloaded this white paper, show this other thing, right? It's very simple, 
uh, but still quite powerful. You can do a lot with it. It's definitely where you want to get started because it's all out of the box. It's super easy to use and configure. The next one is behavioral personalization. So this really takes uh, your personalization strategy to the next level because now we're not just personalizing based on interactions, like did they download something, did they come in from a campaign, right? Now we're personalizing both more on the more abstract exhibited behaviors, okay? So in Sitecore, there's kind of two concepts. There's goals and events. These are things people did on the site. Over here, there are behaviors that are exhibited. They're more abstract. So a, an event might be, I downloaded a white paper. I clicked, an action, I clicked a call to action. A behavior might be, I prefer high-level information versus I prefer detailed specifications. Those are preferences, behaviors that I exhibit that tend to show I prefer this kind of experience over that kind of experience. And this is why I say personas are the foundation of a good personalization strategy, because a persona, the whole point of the persona is to describe the behaviors a user exhibits on the site. These aren't things they do. These are the more abstract behaviors, patterns of behaviors. Uh, and so behavioral personalization is incredibly powerful. Let's just say I'm selling a tool, and maybe I'm, I, I, I'm exhibiting behaviors where I'm just, I just want the, the price, versus I'm looking at every spec table for every drill. Right, those are two different, <coughs> They're not really events in the sense of things that I did in the site. They're patterns of content interactions. This person is exhibiting a behavior of looking at spec after spec after spec after spec. So what then could we show him to help draw him to that call to action? Is there a white paper? Because if they prefer detailed information, maybe at that point we should show that white paper with all the goodness that they could ever consume. Versus if you're exhibiting more behaviors on comparing products, or uh, doing price search, or reviews, right? Those are di a different set of behaviors, and your call to action might be different. Maybe your call to action in that case is show me the top rated products, that kind of thing. So behavioral personalization is, I think, one of the most effective ways to personalize, because I'm getting into the heart of that user and why they're here, and what they're doing, and what we need to do to get them to go to the next level. Does that make sense? The next one is automated personalization. <clears throat> I'm way off the official documentation here. But basically, in my mind, I have, I have a, a persona. Every persona is on a journey. They came to your website for a reason. They're here, they're trying to get here and we may want to have them go here instead. That journey can be mapped in the platform, and I can personalize based on where they're at in that journey. If they're here and I'm trying to get them here, what behaviors have we seen in the past that lead them to go from here to here in that journey? How can we personalize in that particular stage? And so what you kind of end up here is you kind of end up with a uh, a 2D model of personalization opportunity. I have a persona and their unique behaviors and goals and motivators, but I also have where that persona is on their journey. And so if I'm just researching tools, uh, I'm, I'm totally thinking of off the top of my head, so forgive me if I botch something. Um, maybe I shouldn't even go there. <laughs> I don't want to say anything that's not, uh, uh, complimentary or anything like that. But that's, that's kind of how that, that works, is now I have the persona and their journey, and I can know where they're at in that journey at any point in time, and I can personalize to try to get them from here to there, and with those two, uh, now my personalization is super powerful, powerful. Conceivably, if you have six personas, you might have six different journeys that they could be going down, especially in a complex B2B world, you really start to see uniqueness in personas that tend to end up in different journeys uh, in how those different personas buy. And that's the whole point of this. You're trying to get people to buy. And uh, so that's that third facet. So in my presentation, I'm going to talk about all three of these in more detail. Let's see. Most problems. I really should get 
a, an actual clicker. And one of these days I'll do this. Is that in the gift bag? Because that would be <laughs> <laughs> All right. So rules-based personalization. Let's cover some of the basics. Uh, if you've ever been in Strikecore before, and you've ever clicked on a component, you'll see here we have a little people icon in the component. That's the personalization icon. When you click on that, you can choose what you want to do. And I can add these personalization rules. So for example, I'm saying here, you know, where the region is Georgia, or it's California, or it's Ohio, I'm showing a different piece of content for each. So again, this is that if this, then that. I can have tiered rules. In this case, it's first come, first serve. So it matches on the first one, and if it doesn't match at the bottom, you have a default piece of content. So that's how that works. There are over 50 out-of-the-box rules, and Sitecore is adding new rules, it seems like, every update. Um, a year ago when I wrote my book, there were uh, 20 or so, and it's doubled in, uh, over the past year, which is exciting. It means that the power of the out-of-the-box capability is growing uh, with every release. Uh, here's your line of code, so developers, here you go. <laughs> it's super easy to create custom rules. Uh, I create custom rules all the time. Every business is unique. You probably have some data somewhere that you need to uh, leverage to influence what you show or don't show. Maybe you have a custom, actually one of my favorite custom personalization rules is an abstract rule that says if this property in my user profile equals this value from that list. Does that make sense? It's a general rule where I can say any field in the profile equals any value that I have in this item. It's so effective. You use that one rule for like 50 things. Um, so unless they've created that since, that's probably one of my uh, favorite custom rules to build because it has infinite possibilities basically. Because most of the time when you're using a rule, you, you're trying to get some data about that user. Where should that data be? It should be in their user profile, right? You don't want to make a web service call in a personalization rule that takes three seconds to make a round trip. Because now my page is hanging, waiting for that rule to resolve, right? You put that close to the request, you put that in the profile, and it's a lot, more, a lot faster. Uh, but it's very simple. All you have to do is have a uh, extend rule context and return true or false. Your code can do anything it needs to do inside the rule. You could call the profile, web service, uh, look at the context, whatever it needs. It just has to return true or false. All right, let's talk a little bit more about behavioral personalization because that's all the easy stuff. I'm sure you guys all have, have played around with some of those things already. All right, so I, again, personalization is sometimes a nebulous abstract word. Uh, one of my favorite ways to get people to think about personalization is to think about how they segment their customers today. Marketers are awesome at segmenting for email blasts, right? I mean, we, we pull lists from all over the place and we sort and filter until we get a very specific set of email addresses that we want a specific campaign to target. We're, marketers are great at doing that. We, we get data from all over, we merge, we create a list, we create a campaign, we send the email. Personalization is a lot like that in many aspects. So for example, uh, it's very common to segment on uh, downloads or request a demo. Like, I want to do an email blast to everybody who's ever requested a demo, right? That kind of thing. I can know that from Sitecore as well. I can know if somebody downloaded a white paper. I can pull a report of all the users who have done a campaign interaction, other demographics. I can personalize off of all those things. I could also personalize based off of brand preference. So how do you know um, uh, Milwaukee is just one brand, so that's probably not a good example. Um, and these are four different websites, so that's actually a bad example too. Sometimes though, within the same site, you have multiple brands, multiple different products. And you might want to start to observe the preferences of a user over time toward a particular brand over another. I think that's a great opportunity for behavioral tagging and behavioral personalization. I'm starting to understand. So if I'm going to do a campaign, I want to understand, you know, I want to target that email to be as targeted as possible. 
And so in my digital experience, maybe I'll start tagging based off of uh, brand interactions. And I could then pull a list of those contacts right out of XTB, or in this case, show some personalization to personalize if uh, somebody has exhibited one product brand over another. Another one could be industry. Uh, so especially in the B2B space, most B2B companies have an industry section on their website. Wouldn't it be great to have a list of contacts and to know for these contacts which industries they're, they're in, even if they haven't qualified to any particular company? We know just based on their interaction on our website. Uh, we could also track behaviors around content preferences. So I kind of mentioned the example of high level versus detailed specs, maybe video, pa uh, video content, white papers. So if I'm personalizing or doing some email blast, a big part of that blast or campaign is what content should I show the user? Do they want a white paper? Do they want a demo? Do they want a spec sheet? You know, what do they want? What do they need to make that buying decision? Wouldn't it be great to tag our content in Sitecore and over time, maybe over 12 months, we have 12 months of data on Phil. Let's look at what Phil has done over the past year and try to understand what content he prefers. Now in my campaigns or my personalization, I can deliver the right format of content and the right content and with marketing automation at the right time later down the road. The last one is probably my favorite. I love personalizing based on persona. You probably spent forty, fifty thousand dollars to come up with these personas, right? Uh, the four marketers in the room, you might, you might have done that before. You create these personas, they're beautiful personas, and maybe uh, they influence a feature list. Okay, now we have our features, and then the personas go in the garbage. Has that ever happened to you guys? You create these personas, and they're, they're, their useful lifespan is like three weeks. Uh, but they're beautiful and you pay that agency a ton of money to create them. Well, the opportunity now with Sitecore is I can implement those personas in the tool and the platform can learn the behaviors of that user and map those behaviors to a configured persona and over time grow in an understanding of what persona this user is. How powerful is that? We, we create these personas because we wanted to understand our user. We want to segment our user. We want, we want to understand what features and capabilities we need on our site to meet the needs of the user. Well, we did all that research. Let's take that research and use it to drive a relevant, engaging experience for our users through persona-based personalization. Um, so that's another thing. So I like to think of it this way. How do you segment your users today, right? That's a great place to start with a personalization strategy conversation. Because we're doing personalization all the time in marketing departments. Sitecore is not that different. Let's take that body of knowledge and bring it now into the Sitecore platform and learn where we can extend that. So we're doing these kinds of things today. With Sitecore, we can start to do these kinds of things. And now whether it's personalization or that next email campaign, the granularity of my segmentation is so much more uh, infinite, infinitely granular, because of what the platform can tell me about my users. Uh, so the effectiveness of your campaigns are, are going to be a lot, they're going to drive a lot more value. And actually, this is not an EXM topic, but that's another of my, one of my favorites. So with email personalization, I could have one email that targets 10,000 people across the entire population but it's personalized so that each one of those emails is interacted with differently. You know, in a typical email campaign, that would be 20 emails that you have to craft, author, distribute, report on, aggregate, right? That's just a lot of work. So if you want to simplify your email life, you should be thinking about EXM, in my opinion. Uh, it's, a, it's a sister story to the one I'm giving here. All right, so let's get a little bit more into the tool. What do we mean when I say you can build this in Sitecore? So Sitecore has a concept called a profile. Um, the, the nomenclature here is surprisingly challenging, so I'm going to go as slow as I can. Uh, a profile has a set of behaviors. I, I like the word behavior. Sitecore calls them profile keys, which I think is stupid. But a profile exhibits a certain set of behaviors. We call those keys. 
for whatever reason. Those behaviors are then mapped to a profile card. So a profile card is a cluster of behaviors. That's why I like the word persona, because people know what a persona is, at least marketers do. A persona is a cluster of behaviors. A profile card is a set of behaviors configured differently for each card. A pattern card matches the user that's on the site at any given moment to one of the pattern uh, profile cards. So what happens is these profile cards are tagged to content. So I put a profile card on a piece of content. Uh, depending on how I score those behaviors, those scores are logged in the session. And I accumulate points, so to speak. Let's just, if I have 10 behaviors, I accumulate points across those 10. And I have a, a varied distribution of points. The pattern card is the pattern of point distribution that Sitecore uses to match the current visit uh, or a set of visits over six months, which is a cool thing, to the profile card. As a mouthful, I get it. It took me 12 months just to say what I just said in, in, with any competency. Um, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So within the marketing, um, control panel, there's a tab called Profiles. Underneath Profiles, I have my profile card. I called it Persona, but this can be named whatever you want it, right? Underneath my, pers my profile card, I have my uh, profiles. Sorry, <laughs> here I go. This is my profile. These are my keys. And then I have my cards down here. So the keys, these are my behaviors. So this is an example, a real world example, I built for an intranet. So Sitecore is a great platform for intranets too, because there's a lot of opportunity for personalization and all that good stuff, right? So different people on the intranet exhibited different behaviors. Some people were looking for apps, some people wanted were contributing a lot of content, some people went there to learn new stuff, uh, some people went there to find people, some people wanted to find policies, right? Those are behaviors that people can exhibit on the internet. We uh, characterize those behaviors as personas. So the agency, in this case, they built up all these personas. I just built them into Sitecore. I took their deliverable, implemented it in the tool. Here's an example of Lenny, uh, Lenny the learner. I say learner, well shucks, this is covering it up. But the learner behavior is given 10. So it's a 10 point scale. And so he favors learning over these other behaviors, and here's that distribution of behaviors. So now what happens is I tag, um, how do I get to this here? Um, I'll come back to this. Hold, it, hold that thought. Actually, I'll just hold that thought. Um, behaviors aren't necessarily personas. I just love the persona example. Uh, a, a set of behaviors, a profile card or a profile or a pattern match really can be anything. And here's an example of, these aren't personas, we just want to tag content with vacation types. Because I want to understand, over time, what vacation types does this user prefer? That, that's a great segmentation opportunity. So I just wanted to throw that out there to say that it's not just personas, it can be any kind of behavior. Uh, and this is an example of that. So going back to personas, I should probably move these slides around. Uh, here's Lenny, so this is an example of something the agency whooped up. Uh, their goals, motivators, pain points, all those things. The interesting thing is when I took this deliverable, I had that Sitecore lens on it. And at, with every bullet, I had a very specific measurement strategy on how we are going to measure these different pieces. Because what we want to understand is do we even know our users? You know, if we think we know these users, we spent $50,000 to come up with these personas, uh, we want to understand if we're, act if, if we're right. And we want to measure these different behaviors and report on them over time. And it could be that we learn new things about our users. We have to go back to the personas and update them because uh, they're, uh, they're different than we thought they were. Uh, so I, I guess I already jumped ahead a little bit. Here's Lenny. Here's a distribution of those behaviors that I mentioned. Uh, here's a piece of content. You can do this in the Experience Editor too, which I recommend. Anytime a marketer has to go into the Content Editor, developers, we failed. We all agree, right? Maybe. 
most marketers spend most of their time in the content editor, which is a shame, right? That the whole point of the, anyhow. So here's a piece of content, and if you click this little people icon, this is where you can start tagging those personas or those profiles. And so now over time, as I uh, interact with that content, Sitecore starts to learn which persona I am, because that point distribution is occurred and matched with that pattern card. Uh, you can even have an unbalanced distribution. Any particular piece of content might not be for a specific user. It might be across a set of personas. Someone will have to yank me off if I get on a roll. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Very helpful. All of this is boiled up into the user profile. So again, pattern matching can happen over the course of years. I can exhibit the Lenny persona over a long period of time. I can actually even configure uh, what's called profile decay. So at some point, I might want to favor recent visits over older visits, right? So it's kind of like, a, what's that example with rocks? How do they date rocks, right? Carbon dating? Uh, Sitecore has its own version of carbon dating. They call it pro profile decay. Um, actually, another point here, CRM integration. Uh, I think CRM integration is table stakes for every Sitecore deployment. I mean, what's the point of collecting all this great information about your user and you're not putting it into your marketing or sales engines? Uh, so just a little soapbox item there. All right, so here's an example of the out-of-the-box rule where I say where the current visit matches the Paula pattern card in the persona profile. So that one rule does everything we just talked about. The biggest thing here is you need a really, really good content strategy to make this work. Um, so here's an example. Now, when you think about it, any piece of content can be viewed from multiple perspectives. Uh, so, you know, my coined phrase here is a content strategy is the foundation of your personalization strategy. What good does it do to have all these personas built in the tool if you don't have content that meets the needs of those personas? If you don't have content that meets the needs of those behaviors? Uh, and actually, the two kind of work together. Um, I think persona, uh, personas and content strategy are kind of the yin and the yang, so to speak. Uh, they, they go together. Uh, what might happen, and actually something I often do um, is I'll help a customer, we'll, we'll take their personas, and I'll map them into the platform as best I can. What might happen is maybe we only have content for one persona or two personas. That's actually what happens most of the time. Most people are only writing content with one perspective in mind. And so it's actually a really great content gap analysis. So I take their personas, I build them into the tool, we tag content and we, we see that distribution of content, we can see if that distribution is fair across all the personas. Where, where it's not fair, now I have a built-in content gap uh, uh, strategy and now I can take that and I can give that to my content authors and I can say write this content because we don't have content in our site speaking this language for this person in this point in time. That makes sense, all right? How am I doing in time? About a half hour. Half hour left. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Break up the demo. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Automated. So, I I think I'm not going to go through this whole thing. This is actually just a stupid screenshot I grabbed from Google. The point is, <laughs> the the point is, start thinking about customer journey, not personalization. Really, what are you trying to get your users to do? Uh, the, the phrase I like to use is personalization with a purpose, right? Our users here, and we're trying to get them to here to buy or to share or whatever, right? So I like to think of personalization in terms of journey. What journey is my user on? What do we need to do to facilitate that journey? That really is the essence of any personalization strategy. We're way beyond now the little ticky-tacky, if this, then that junk, right? We're trying to transform our business uh, with this kind of stuff. Um, and so this is pretty exciting. Um, so when you think about it, I actually had a customer, um, 
they had a, a 3D personalization content strategy model that I helped them create. So on one axis, we had persona. Every persona had different wants and needs and goals. On another axis, we had our buying stage, right? So where is that user in their journey? And then the third dimension of the content strategy, strategy was uh, uh, not industry, it was uh, product type, product category, okay? So when you think about it, you have this 3D model of content uh, that's honed in on a specific user at a specific time who favors a specific line of product. And now when you think about, you got user, time, and space, or it's, I'm getting Star Trek on you a little bit, but that piece of content in that moment when they hit that home page, how targeted is that now? It's super targeted. We're approaching kind of that one-on-one -on -one marketing nebulous concept because we know where they're at in the journey. We have our customers, customer journeys mapped as engagement plans. We know what persona they're at, and we have a content strategy that aligns across both of those axes. And now when they hit that home page, we give them the right message at the right time for the right product that we know they're interested in. Um, that's a lot of work. I mean, I'm not, this is definitely, we're beyond the low hanging fruit phase of this whole thing. But the, the, the power is the potential here. Hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm helping you think a little bigger uh, than you were earlier. This is a, an engagement plan. So here's a journey that I created for an insurance company. This company wanted to understand uh, users hitting their website with passive interest. They wanted to understand when they had qualified interest. Different things qualified their interest. Uh, and then at some point, a user is researching insurance plans. They want to they understand those uh, people that were researching plans. And then lastly, when they've initiated an application but has not yet been approved. Right, so you think about that journey as an insurance company, and you think about the potential now to personalize. If I have passive interest, what are the behaviors, what are the calls to actions, what are the email campaigns that drive them to qualify? What drives them to compare plans, to contact a broker, those kinds of things? And when they've initiated, what can we do to continue to engage them? Uh, if you if you worked with Pardot, Pardot is a very familiar concept, uh, is what I'm talking about here. So if that if that if you need that translation, that's one way to think of it. Basically, what happens is every time a user moves from one state to the next, we can do a bunch of stuff. That stuff is called actions. There's a bunch of out of the box actions. Your developers can create custom actions. I can also have a thing called triggers. A trigger is what facilitates the move from one state to the next. Uh, so as I'm engaging in my content, different things will trigger uh, that state. Um, so the, 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 I mentioned part of it. Um, the interesting thing there is that's all email and landing pages. That's my universe. In Sitecore, my universe is everything. I have my landing pages in Sitecore. I have my email campaigns in Sitecore. I have my websites in Sitecore. I have my mobile apps in Sitecore. All of that can be orchestrated with an engagement plan. And I can have intelligence across my entire customer journey, across all platforms. This is super cool stuff. Um, I do often integrate with Pardot because a lot of people use it. Likewise, a lot of people use Salesforce and all that stuff. And sometimes you need to do that. I wouldn't ever say Sitecore is your CRM. Uh, but it's worth taking a peek at some of these capabilities, just with the potential of seeing across all those devices, across all those platforms and experiences is pretty compelling. <clears throat> Here's some reporting. So if you've ever wondered as a marketer, uh, what campaign should I do this month? Have you ever asked yourself that? Um, this report is a really helpful report. So if I have this customer journey mapped in the platform, I can see visually where my users are at in the journey. Uh, what might often be the case is I might see a bottleneck in the journey. People are getting stuck researching plans, right? So let's target all the people researching pl plans with a campaign to try to get them to move from here to here. And now I, I have my, this is kind of my out of the box campaign idea generator, just with a report that helps you see where your users are and, and where, what content they might need to nudge them along, right? That's the whole point of this, is giving people the right content at the right time. 
Uh, let's see. Was that, what, what's this one? I think I just mentioned that. So here's an example of, I want to personalize my homepage based on when Paula visits from this campaign, has expressed interest in white papers, and is showing 80% probability to convert. Okay. So what this means is they need this white paper when they hit my homepage next time. So two weeks from now when they come back, we're going to show them that white paper. Because we know they like white papers. We know they came from a white paper campaign from Facebook, perhaps. And we know that they're at a high probability quote. Maybe that white paper is a summarized version with a strong call to action to request a demo or call someone. Uh, but we're just getting very targeted now in our segment. All right, so testing. How do I know I'm making an impact? It's an important thing. We don't want to personalize just for fun. We want to personalize to drive impact. Um, so what is content testing? You guys have probably heard of A-B testing. Yeah, nothing new there. Um, in Sitecore, I can test two pieces of content. I can test variations in components. So for example, I want to show this component with 50% of the users and this other component with the other 50%. So we're not talking just content, we're talking about entirely swapping out components to totally change the look and feel of our homepage. I can also just test against two pages. So when they go here, show this page, when, or show this page for the other half. Uh, you can also do a multivariate test. Most tests have hundreds of variations to them. So if your homepage has eight components uh, where you're testing content with six personalization rules, I mean, I'm sure that's over 100 potential versions of the page. So how do you know which version of the page is the best version? Content testing will do that. It'll run a test across all 100 versions of the page, and it'll tell you which version uh, was the most successful. You can also test personalization, kind of. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's super easy. Um, Sitecore's motto is test everything all the time, and it's true. You really should, because it's so easy. You just click a button and then you come back a week later and you select the version that did the best. Um, the trick is it has to be on high volume pages. You're not gonna A-B test some spec sheet deep in your website. Uh, to achieve statistical, st statistical relevance, you need a lot of visits. So you're probably testing your landing pages, your home pages, key service pages. Uh, but you can see all the versions that it tests there. If this is all repeat, I'll try to go through it quickly. Uh, when the test is done, uh, it'll, you'll see a report that shows, for all those versions, the engagement value that were generated for each version. And I can see which version created the most engagement value, and I can pick as winner. When I pick as winner, that then becomes the published version of that page. So here's an example of that. All right, so the problem with personalization testing is there's no specific way to test a particular personalization rule. The problem is it's one rule in the hundred of possibilities. So you have to kind of be, I call it the Pac-Man approach. This is the first option here. You can, you can view the impact of the page at an aggregate. So for example, it's Monday and I show up and I'm like, hey, I should do this personalization. So I configure the personalization, I click start a test. I then tell all my content people, I say, don't make any more changes because I want to see the result of this change, this one change. I wait a few days, I see the result, I see if it had a positive or negative impact. So I saw the impact of that one change, um, but I kind of had to not make any other changes to actually measure that impact, which isn't always possible. I call that the Pac-Man approach. Yeah, there it is. Make a change, test. Make a change, test, repeat. So if you do that, you can see the impact of your personalization. Um, one way to do it is, so typically when you have a personalization rule, it's, there's some call to action. They click a button, and that could be, that button click could be a goal that's triggered. And I could create a goal for every personalization rule, um, and thereby get a report of every time Somebody clicked this last week versus clicked it this week. The, the problem with this, now that is very effective. It will give you the report. You will know the impact of that personalization. The problem is now you might have hundreds or thousands of goals 
Uh, so you could get gold proliferation uh, if you're not managing those. But it's out of the box, and it will give you a very specific measurement of the impact of that change. Uh, likewise, um, events. If you don't know the difference of goals and events, there's a subtle difference there. Um, and perhaps a custom script. I have a theory that this is all in XDB somewhere, right? XDB, it does everything. So perhaps one of the developers could whip up a really sweet script and solve our problems. That's my theory. Uh, but that's kind of the approaches for testing the impact of personalization. Does that make sense? So, all right, got 10 more minutes. One more thing I want to call out is the Experience Explorer. Raise your hand if you even know this exists. Okay, like four people. Yeah, that's a problem. So the Experience Explorer is almost just as cool as the Experience Editor. It allows me to literally pretend I'm someone else and click around in my site and simulate a user. So if I want to simulate somebody from San Francisco that came in from this Facebook campaign who downloaded that white paper, I can go into Experience Explorer, do my presets, set all that up, go uh, dive into my website and test my personalization. Because that's one of the big, biggest problems. Your, your QA team probably has no idea that you're doing personalization anyhow. Um, but this could be a way where you, you, you engage in formal QA, or you're just curious. I want to know what somebody from with these attributes, what, what experience they get when they browse my site. So super effective. I recommend checking it out. All right, with the last few minutes, uh, let's talk a little bit about getting started. Uh, so this is the journey that I've talked about. I'm not going to go through all this right here, but I can send you these slides and stuff if you want to chew on it. I'm going to skip to some of these bullets. So you just got this big vision of all this possibility. Well, you've had it for two years because Sitecore sold you on it two years ago, right? The hard part is where do I get started? Um, we want to find the low-hanging fruit. So there are out-of-the-box rules. I mentioned that bank example. I kind of poo-pooed it, but not really. I mean, it really is, it is making an impact for their brand. And I think it's a great place to start. So many customers want to play, you know? We don't want to spend a ton of money on personalization strategy right now. We just want to get our feet dirty, feet wet, right? Uh, th those all the box rules are a great opportunity. Go through those rules, look at them, just think if there's possibility there. GYP detection, goals or events, campaigns. Uh, most of the time, marketers, we have our, we have our uh, landing pages and some other tool somewhere else, right? Well, in most of those landing pages, are always squeeze pages, right? There's like one thing you can do on that page. Well, in B2C, that might work, but in B2B, it doesn't work. These are complex sales. And why not link them to your site? Why not invite them to engage in your content? And as a result, you know, do some personalization based off of an incoming campaign. We don't have to be afraid anymore of them leaving the landing page because we won't lose that insight. Uh, we, we can track that entire campaign from email click uh, through the end of the purchase. So I'm not as worried about that anymore. Uh, branding imagery I mentioned, goals, events, and outcomes. So every single Sitecore deployment should have goals, events, failure events, and outcomes configured. If you don't, you might as well turn off XDB because there's really no point. Uh, Sitecore doesn't really log anything you can't get with Google Analytics unless you tell it to. Did you know that? So goals, events, failure events, and outcomes are the things you tell Sitecore to log so that you get value out of the analytics. When you go to the user profile, you'll actually see stuff there that, that means something. Uh, as a result, you can personalize all, all those things. A goal might be request a demo. Goals are typically things we're trying to get the user to do. Events are things they came here to do of, of their own initiative, like find a white paper or view the news or check out the latest stock ticker price or whatever it might be. Uh, but you can personalize all of those. Outcomes are financial. Uh, so I, could, I can measure the financial impact of any specific customer over time. So I could literally segment based on uh, my best customers. And that can all be managed within Sitecore. Outcomes have a financial, it, they did this thing which resulted in this financial transaction, which might be again, a good opportunity for personalization. 
Uh, profile metadata. So I mentioned that custom rule, my favorite custom rule. Uh, if this field equals that, uh, that's a great opportunity for personalization. You can get a ton of value just by personalizing off of stuff in the user profile. So if you, you probably have a CRM. Raise your hand if you use Salesforce or your company does. Well, the, the three of you, I'll talk to you for a minute. <laughs> I bet everybody would raise their hand if you, if you weren't sleepy or something. Um, we, you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars creating this contact in CRM, right? It's great. We run all our campaigns, we have all this intelligence about this user. Well, use CRM integration, bring all that metadata into Sitecore, and now I can personalize based on any facet from my CRM. Uh, that there's so much potential there. I don't even have to get into personas and all that garbage. Just by personalizing based off of that contact record, the potential is almost limitless just with that one thing. I, I would call that low hanging fruit. You don't have to spend a ton of money on strategy to understand the potential of what you already know about your users in your CRM. Uh, campaign call to action. So I mentioned these squeeze pages. We're driving everybody to this one page with this one thing with this one button. But in the real world, that's not how people buy it. They need to research everything before they make a decision. So tracking that campaign interaction from that landing page into my experience, there's a ton of potential now to know um, across that entire life cycle of content. All right, so walk. Let's walk a little bit. We just got done crawling. Let's walk. Um, develop personas. I've talked a lot about personas. If you don't have personas and you want to do transformational personalization, you need personas. I'll just throw that out there. Um, if you have personas, you probably don't have the right personas. So, for the five or six marketers, raise your hand if you have corporate personas. These are like customer segments at a corporate level. Okay. They're not helpful. I'll just, you might as well throw them in the garbage. Because the problem is, you need a persona that maps the behaviors for a website, right? You might, if you have six websites, you need six sets of personas if you really want to do what I'm talking about here. Generic, corporate, high level personas uh, are not going to provide enough granularity in those behaviors on a given experience to really write the right content, first of all, or tag that content or personalize out that content, or nonetheless, map to a journey. Um, the journey you take in this experience might be a totally different journey in something else over there. So that's, that's one of my core recommendations is have a set of personas that align to a experience. Because uh, if you don't, um, yeah, anyhow. So map those personas in a site code. I think you can do that right away if you have them. It's a great way to generate a content gap assessment. Map them in a site core and see where you stopped having content. And you can then you know, use a, a good spreadsheet to show the distribution of content to personas. You might find that you favor some personas over others. And worst case, you favor low value personas, right? Maybe you're writing content for customers that aren't your best customers. So that's a good exercise to go through. That's that content gap analysis that I mentioned. Uh, now I can take that content gap analysis, I can give it to my agency, I can tell them, write me this content. You know, most of the agencies are going to come up and they're going to pitch this content strategy thing and you're like, well, I trust you, here's my money. In this scenario, no, I can actually give them a prescriptive, here are my gaps, fill these gaps. Yeah, so it's very, I don't know. I like that uh, arrangement. And then after that, I can configure personalization at the intersection of those behaviors and content needs. I'm filling the gaps. When the gaps are filled, that then becomes my personalization strategy, uh, if that makes sense. Extended email. Web and email, it, the days are done when we treat these things as two separate things. People bounce back and forth between these uh, channels all the time. Uh, so an integrated web and email content and personalization strategy, in my opinion, is essential. Uh, I don't differentiate anymore between the two. Uh, FXM, so actually, the, an interesting opportunity is personalize my non-site core sites. So I have, a, I have some WordPress thing out here. 
uh, let's use FXM to introduce personalized content onto that WordPress site that came from Sitecore, which is another interesting opportunity. Uh, so that's the cool thing about the platforms. I can know every single interaction across every experience. It doesn't even have to be Sitecore. Um, so there's a ton of potential. FXM is like one line of code. You drop on a page and a rule you set up uh, in FXM. It's so easy to set up. There's a ton of potential there. It's a great opportunity too if you are, uh, if you want to slowly get into the platform. You know, you might, you might not want to spend $500,000 to build that site this year. Maybe that got kicked into 2018. So instead of doing nothing for the next 12 months, let's use FXM and start doing something in the meantime. Uh, I've actually been in some interesting dialogues where some uh, consultancies are leading with F FXM. So you have a 12-month website project. Uh, Milwaukee you just mentioned that. Well, you're already on Sitecore. Uh, so instead of waiting 12 months to get value out of the platform, get value out of it today while you build your site. And then the cool thing is, when you finally release your site, I have 12 months of data to personalize off versus starting with nothing. So there's so much value in FXM that I don't think people really think through a lot. Okay, let's run. How much time do we have to run? Zero time. Okay. So, uh, create a journey map for each persona. In my mind, if, you don't, if, if every persona doesn't have its own journey, it's not really a persona. What's the point? The whole point of the persona is to understand how people buy differently. So each persona should have its own version of a journey. Uh, implement, physically build that journey as an engagement plan within Sitecore. And then start dropping people into that journey and personalizing based off of stage. Now we're into the total panacea, white ivory tower stuff. Uh, but it is possible. People do it all the time in part out today. Let's do it in Sitecore. Um, CRM, e-commerce, digital other marketing tools, extending into those tools with FXM and other things I've mentioned already is important. So I leave you with this slide. If, if you were to ask me, Phil, if, if you're going to create a personalization strategy for Milwaukee or wherever, what would be in that personalization strategy? It would be this. A personalization strategy is an all-encompassing document that describes <coughs> where we are today, the vision for the future, how we get started, and going through each of the three types of personalization. Let's start here today with rules-based. Let's work on these personas and move into behavioral. Let's create these journeys and move into a transformational personalization. So a personalization strategy includes all of that, and just as importantly, a content strategy. If you were to hire me to create a personalization strategy, but we also didn't have somebody understanding and writing content, there's no point. If you don't have content to show at the right time, at the right place, for the right user, why did you spend all that money on the personalization? So I think this to me is that all-encompassing what is personalization within Cycle. So I'll, I'll end there. Any, do we want to do some Q&A? Or I can hang out afterwards too, because I know we're out of time. Cool. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, in setting up uh, sites where we've got all different players that are coming up with the personas, they're you know establishing the, the goals, getting the glide paths on the website that speaks to your site map, the content, all that. You then map those personas in Sitecore. Where would we, because new patterns are gonna emerge, right? Not everyone's gonna map to a persona. Right. Would we do that, pull that data out of Sitecore, set that back up, put it back in as a persona? Can we do that in Sitecore? Yeah, so an interesting opportunity, and I'll admit this is a bit theoretical, but let me get on my theory world. That's a very important point, because you're right, new behaviors will emerge. We make these assumptions about these personas, and over time, we're gonna learn new things about those personas. The question is, how will we learn? What's the feedback mechanism that tells us that Lenny isn't Lenny, right? So um, there is a lot you can do with just out-of-the-box reporting, scene pattern matches. There's a lot of manual digging. So I could say, I could go to Phil, who's Lenny, and I could individually uh, investigate his interactions to validate that Lenny is Lenny. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work. So you, you can do all that. You can do more research to validate the research. Um, I have a theory, though, that with machine learning tools, 
it would be very easy, I think, to um, leverage machine learning to look at that data and help us understand if new patterns are emerging. I mean, that is the point of machine learning, is to understand patterns. So conceivably, I'll get, I'll get way out on a limb here, conceivably, I don't have to hire agencies to build personas anymore. I could just take Azure ML and stick it on my website for six months, and then it will tell me what, who my personas are, right? That's a bit theoretical, but I mean, that's, that's, the, possible, that's the opportunity. Is machine learning takes a set of data, XTB, and over time, it identifies patterns in that data. If we configure that machine learning to look for behavioral patterns, we should see pattern clusters. And what are pattern clusters? Those are the personas. So I think both machine learning should tell us who our personas are, but could also validate that our personas are who we think they are. And actually at, um, uh, at Shukan uh, in Europe, someone gave a talk on this. Not, not in the context of personas, but just in the context of Azure ML on XDB. Um, so I'm taking her, Amanda, is it Amanda? Yeah, she, yeah. yeah, so she gave a presentation, it's actually posted on YouTube. She gave a presentation on taking Azure ML, well it wasn't Azure ML, it was something else. Some machine learning thing, and pointed it to XCB to just understand web analytics better. But I think you could do the same thing with uh, a bend toward personas. I have a, a general question for all of us as a developer. I see that like some, I'm sure there's some marketers and other people out there within organizations who there's a certain fear factor. They look at this, they look at the site up and all. Is that something you came across where there's kind of like deer in the headlights? And if so, how do you, is yeah. that, how, how, how do we go and try and create that want within the company? Yeah, as far as just like the where to get started deer in the headlights? Well, really, I think like obviously I see some companies where we, we have site core. We yeah. have this personalization. We see we can get from A to B, but we're having a getting that buy-in from the powers that be and seeing we know the power of this tool. How do you get buy-in from people when they're older generation, you know what I mean, and get yeah. get get them pick started, do you know what I mean? Well that's a good question. Um, so not to toot my own horn, but I do have a, a short uh, assessment where I mean, what, what you basically forget me, what you want to do is educate and cast a vision. And so getting those stakeholders in a room, in a workshop, educating on the capabilities, but also brainstorming possibilities. Taking those possibilities and articulating them in a vision statement and in a roadmap, I think is a great way to uh, just grab their attention. And that's something you could perhaps help us with. Yeah. We need each other's assistance. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? All right, thank you. All right. Thank you, Bill. We need to continue to disrupt. We need to continue to change the game. So we're going after these new categories and we're disrupting the way that the user feels about those products. They're leading the pack right now in development of tools, technology, advancements. They raised the bar. We chose to innovate each and every product we come out with from the ground up. It starts with a focus on our users. It's really nice that they're trying to make tools for each specific trade that makes our job easier and faster, safer. I feel Milwaukee Tool is constantly striving to meet the goals of each specific trade and every tool that they come out with. It's what Milwaukee's about, building the best and they're the best what they do. My opinion, probably within about the last eight years, Milwaukee has outperformed everybody else. That's all I have right now in my tool cart. They work hands-on with the people in the trades, and if something's not right, they better it and make a better product. Milwaukee Tools have been definitely been listening to what we say.
because what's most important is not just what we've done, but what our users and our distribution partners think of this. Milwaukee Tool, they're our premier partner. Uh, I know our uh, foreman and our uh, journeymen, they all love the tools. Not many tool companies can do multiple genres of tools well. You guys nail everything. It is so far above and beyond. It feels like Milwaukee's a team, all of you together. Everyone seems very excited about what they're doing and consumed by the challenge of making their products better. It's not just about our new products, it's really about our culture and, and letting people see what, what we're all about. There's no complacency, none. When we think of our business, we don't think of ourselves as a power tool company or an accessory company or a hand tool company. We think of ourselves as a solution provider, and that's very different. We clearly believe as a company it's grow or die, and there's really no option there as a business. Sitcore with Derek. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're going to talk about troubleshooting Sitecore, kind of what to do when Sitecore is not really your friend. Um, I think we've all been there. Um, first, I, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Derek Dysart. I've been working with Sitecore for about eight years now. Uh, in fact, I was just thinking about it, I think July mark, will mark the eighth year. Uh, it'll be eight years ago, back in 2000, July 2009 was the first Sitecore project I worked on. Um, uh, I have been, uh, I, I used to call myself a freelancer. I, I've got several people working for me now, so I'm kind of a consultancy, uh, a small uh, Sitecore partner. Um, I, I work with several folks. I know the, the I'm working with the Milwaukee Tool folks. Uh, do a lot of maintenance. Uh, and before I even worked with Sitecore, I spent seven years working at Microsoft, and I worked in their professional services division. Uh, first in, in MCS, but then later in Premier Support. And Premier Support is where I kind of got exposed to how to do troubleshooting. Um, and there it would be a case of Premier Support was more, I was more like an account manager for folks that had developer support through Microsoft. So I had, uh, I had customers such as uh, United Airlines, Johnson Controls here, r &L Carriers, um, people doing internal uh, development for their organization. And a lot of times they would, uh, Premier Support, you kind of got to the front of the queue if you called in to uh, what then was called PSS, which was, uh, uh, I can't remember what PSA was like, uh, product support services. Um, but a lot of times, uh, especially in development, it was, it was a case of which, which, which support queue do you go in? If you're building a web application, something's not working, so you're making a web service call. I was there, I was at Microsoft during the era of SOAP and all that, so it was a, you, you would have a, a, something going on and you know, it, it's not working, right? It's, that's, that's the classic thing. And, we would get, we'd start in the, the support queue for IAS, and IAS is like, no, this is on the client side. You've got to go to the IE side. So you'd have like wars between these support queues, and that was what the premier support person was for, was to actually get them both on the, on the, on the line and actually go through the scoping of, here's where the problem is, here's the network trace, see where your product does this, and then it doesn't do that, and then they'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, send the case to my queue. So that's, that's kind of my background of kind of where I came to uh, Sitecore and Sitecore troubleshooting. So this is really the case. You're like, it's not working. Everything's blowing up. You know, the, the, the people could be figuratively or literally running around with their hair on fire. And you're like, well, you know, what can I do? What's the, what the first thing you should really do is step back and just relax. <laughs> take, a, take a deep cleansing breath and, and relax. Because, and, and I don't mean this facetiously, but nobody's going to die because your website's down. Um, I, I have a, my, my wife is a physician, she's a surgeon. When, when something goes wrong with you know, Carolina work, yeah, people could die. But like, we're creating marketing websites. Yes, we could be losing lots of money, but 
at the end of the day, you're just a girl or a guy sitting in a chair in a, in a nice shelter. There's no bears running after you. There's nothing. <laughs> so there's, it's, it's, it's just calm down and, and take a, have a system to approach these, these problems. So a lot of the, one of the first things you really need to do is kind of balance your effort. If, if truly is the site down and it is costing your company millions of dollars an hour, if it is a large e-commerce site, and if you're not able to take orders, that does, I mean, that, that has real financial impact. And I don't mean to belittle that by saying nobody's gonna die. Um, you know, somebody might get fired. <laughs> no, nobody's, nobody's gonna get physically harmed, most likely. Um, so <laughs> balance, <laughs> balance your efforts. Uh, if it's, I gotta get this thing back up, then focus on getting back up. But if you have the chance to start trying to do a little bit of root cause analysis, like how did we get here, what's going on? If it's a case of like, Cycler's not working, it's on my local system because I'm trying to get a module to work that we're gonna try and implement, but then yeah, you've got a lot of time to figure out what's going on because there's not, you know, that's, that's kind of your job at that point. And if it's your fault only, um, and I, I say this, and the, the, the story I'll tell is actually when I started out as freelancing, the first project I got asked to quote, um, they wanted to change out the security system for logging into Sitecore. The, the marketing department had been approached by IT. They're like, wait, would you have the system running in Rackspace? Where's this from? This isn't part of our corporate IT standards. It was a uh, financial services firm. And then they looked at it and said, but well, this doesn't comply to password, our, our, our password stuff. So they found that they, they kind of found me, and they're like, here's a login to Sitecore. Can you estimate how long this is going to take? So I didn't have, and we'll, we'll, uh, I'll get into kind of where I went. But so I, a, didn't have the job yet. It was the first job I was trying to get. Um, and in trying to figure out kind of how their existing password management system worked, um, I basically overwrote the entire the uh, the main assembly that all of the custom code that was running all the site core sub layouts, uh, their custom membership provider. Basically, I, I took their site down. And it's a, I mean, I, I, I won't say the name, but it is a household name in financial services. Fortunately, it was like a, a, it was a marketing site for aimed at their agents. But the first thing I did, and, and this was also on a, on a Saturday afternoon, because I was trying to do this on the side as I was still working somewhere else, because as I was trying to go out on my own. And so I start calling everyone I know, because I'm like, well, look, there goes the job. I just took it on the site. They're obviously not going to hire me. But like, hey, I, you know, I need to get somebody. We need to get, find the backups and all that. Um, long story short, there were no backups. Um, I got lucky. The system, the, the, the system I used to overwrite that file did save a backup. We got it up and running. And I have to report, they're actually still a customer of mine today. Um, they're rolling off the site work, so they won't be uh, much longer. But it's, you've got to own it. Uh, if, you, if you mess something up, own it and, uh, and help fix it. So step zero in, in trying to troubleshoot Sitecore, I like to call it as like, this is the is plugged in moment. And it's, um, a lot of help desks have a, a tactic. Because if you, you know, you call in like, hey, my cable box isn't working. And they're like, is it plugged in? And you're like, of course it's plugged in. Yeah, so like, it's not working. They won't, the, 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 the Jedi mind trick is not to ask, is it plugged in? It's to be, like, you know, I, I think this sounds really weird, but we've had trouble with your model of a uh, of cable box receiver. Can you just unplug it and make sure that the pins aren't bent and plug it back in? So what, what happens there is now they've gone and said, okay, okay, I'll go unplug it. Now that person goes down and looks and it's not plugged in. And so they can be like, they don't have to admit like, oh, it wasn't plugged in. They said, hey, you know what, that worked. I unplugged it and I plugged it back in and it worked great. So it's, it's, these are simple things to do um, the first, first one is like, did you publish the content? Um, and I, I think I, I see a lot of developers smiling because we've all been there. Somebody's like, hey, my new content isn't live. Did you, did you publish it? Um, I, did you include the images when you published that as well? And I, it, this is less of a case in Sitecore, in, lesser, in newer versions of Sitecore, when you publish, you can ask it to publish related items and it will publish out the, the images. Um, did you include the templates when you published? and uh, including the ones you just pushed out. So maybe you have a deployment process, you put some new stuff out there, make sure that that stuff's published. Um, and then really the, the, the best way to check is it published is, is within Sitecore, 
you have to be on the Sitecore desktop, you can't be in the content editor, switch your database to the web database and actually go browse the tree that way and see if the items that you expect to be live are, are actually live. The next kind of, the early step is, is your stuff actually on the server? Use, uh, are, are your config files up there? Use show config, um, and we'll kind of look at that. Um, are your assemblies up there? Are there the right versions? Um, did, you know, if you have a continuous delivery, continuous integration process, did your stuff get deployed out correctly? Um, the, the one on the bottom, I know I, I will fully admit to have run it in before. Are you looking at the right URL? I have gone so far as to completely delete everything off a server, rerun a build, see the files drop on the server, hit the URL, and it's still broken. Only to have somebody else be like, you're looking at the dev server, not the QA server. <laughs> and you, you laugh. So that's where, considering getting a second set of eyes on something, it's, we, we, you, get, you get blind to things after you look at it for so long. And a lot of this is so tedious. A lot of the config files that we look at, um, no, no, XML is supposed to be this great um, format, human readable and all that, but it's very easy to just get lost in the complexity of it. So have a second set of eyes. So I can hear you asking, like, what if I don't have access to the server? And this is where I got into trouble. Um, you can ask, um, you can hack into uh, just about any Sitecore. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean hack, but um, and it, those of you guys who don't know, this is uh, Bobby Hack was a persona from a security-related uh, uh, presentation at the last symposium. But on versions of uh, Sitecore seven two and earlier, there was the developer center. Um, in 7.5, Sitecore removed the developer center, uh, but it's still there. And actually, the reason why I pulled this is actually Robert Hawk behind there. He, uh, he has a, a blog post that I almost, every time I have to use this, I just, I, I Google Sitecore IDE and um, end up finding his blog post. You know what? I lost. There it is. So if I log into on 7.2, Developer Center was under the developer tools. And the great thing here is you can say file open. And now you can get at least any of the files underneath the web root. You can actually open any of these up. You can actually edit the files. Um, somebody was, there's a, there's a stack, uh, stack overflow question of somebody asking, hey, where's this, where did this go? Um, because you can actually go in and edit your views right on the server. Um, or you could open a DLL, uh, view the text representation of it, and save it over that DLL and ensure that Windows can't load that and the entire site goes down. Um, so what happens if you're on Sitecore 8? Uh, this, is a, uh, this is actually 8.2. <laughs> so now that that's actually not there. So what you need to do, and I save this here. If you paste your URL. You can still get at the developer center. The CSS from Sitecore eight kind of messes it up, but you can still go ahead. Um, and open files. Um, and it's a, it's a great tool. A lot of times, you know, rightly so, you may not have access to the production system. You may be able to log in, but you may not have access to the production system. You may not be able to remote desktop to it. But at least with this, you can actually see, did the build actually complete, and are my config file changes out there? Um, this way, you can at least browse the system and read them. Um, more, more likely than not, you're not going to have write access on the server anyway, so the site where process isn't going to be able to rewrite over those, those files, but you can at least still browse them. So we've now, we've made sure everything's on there. What's the next step? You know, it's like we're, um, I, I would say that the, the question that a lot of people ask is like, have you checked the logs? Um, and I would say half of the time, the, the answer to that is a question, where are the logs? Sitecore logs an incredible amount of information into its logs. Um, 
So much so that a lot of people are like, it just is all it does is pollute my disk. I'm gonna shut these logs off. I'm gonna go in the, if it's like where it uses log for net to do all of its logging. And a lot of people on, on servers will just turn that off, flat out turn it off. Um, and it's actually the, the most valuable part of troubleshooting Sitecore is actually looking through those logs. Um, you may look in the Windows Event Viewer if you're on the server. This is less useful. There's a lot more detail in the Sitecore logs. This will tell you large system issues uh, if, if the app pool is crashing. Um, this I took off of uh, one of my QA servers. I think there's something wrong with, um, uh, there's a couple of errors. But you'll see uh, a WER reporting, which is Windows error reporting. If the app pool crashes so many times in a, in a particular amount of time, Windows will say, this site is completely broken. I'm not even gonna try and run it. And it will, um, it will put that up. So if you have a major problem that's causing not just Sitecore, but your entire app pool to go down, uh, that'll show up in the Windows Event Viewer, but there's, there's, it's a little less useful. Um, the log files, if, if you're not aware of it, are stored in your data directory. Uh, more likely than not, this is gonna be where Sitecore is installed. There's a website folder, which is the root of the website, and then there's a data folder. There's a log folder in there, and I think it was around Sitecore 7, um, they actually started breaking the logs out a little bit more. It used to only be this, the, the log, file, um, they break out a lot more of it, so there's, it's, it's a little less um, signal noise in the log file. So the uh, crawling log is the log that uh, happens when your indexing process runs. So whether you're using Lucene or Solar uh, or Coveo and it's indexing your content, um, the, the, the kind of the trace level information from the indexer goes in crawling. Uh, when you execute searches, in Sitecore, particularly through the, the search provider interface, that gets logged into the search log. Um, but the big one you want to look at is the log file. Um, and what I actually really do, I, I even do this on my own local system, is I'll do something called tailing logs. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the concept of tailing a log. Uh, tail comes from the Unix command, tail. Um, the, if you use Unix, <laughs> You tail a text file, it will print out the last five lines of a file. You can say tail-10, and it'll print out the last 10. If you say tail-f, which stands for follow, it'll just keep printing out as lines get written to that file. Um, there are other tools. Um, I hear a lot of people like Beartail. I've never used it. It's a GUI interface that will watch a log file. Um, it's it's kind of nice because you get to kind of feel like you're on the Nebuchadnezzar and watching the matrix. Because especially if you set your terminal, to uh, kind of green text. You can watch the log files come. You can watch the log files go through, and, and Sitecore kind of has a heartbeat that you end up, if you watch this, it's, it's, that's why I kind of liken it to the matrix, is Neil's like, why do you want, why do you look at that? It's like, well, after a while, you can see what's going on just from the green rain coming down on the screen. But um, um, yeah, there's, there's a certain heartbeat to Sitecore as a, a healthy system. This system in particular is taken from one. Um, it's throwing a lot of warnings up because of uh, some placeholders that are it's uh, not, not able to find. Uh, it was just a, a quick capture that I had done to. Oh. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just kidding. Um, can anybody figure out why that you should have done? Well, actually. Wrong. So I shouldn't have gotten a blue screen. I'm just saying because of where. Oh, wait. Um, <laughs> um, finally, with the logs, you can run them through. The, uh, on the marketplace is the Cycro Log Analyzer. Um, this is, it, it is, it's a good tool for spawning patterns in your log. So basically, it is a, it is a tool written, um, written by Cycor. It'll take a, a whole chunk of logs it will parse through them all and then tell you how often does, you know, how often does this event show up. Um, and a lot of times if you're experiencing, you know, if somebody said, hey, something happened and you go and you run it through here and you see that over the past week, 500 times this particular exception has been logged, well, you know it's probably occurring quite a bit and something to look into. So then once, once you've kind of looked at it, the, the thing you're looking for are the exceptions that are getting logged. Sitecore, well, any exception in your code gets logged into the log. Uh, first thing is look at, look, is it your code? Um, look, at, look at the exceptions and the call stack in there. If you have, if you deploy your debug information, so that the symbols that get compiled when you create your, 
your output. You may even have line numbers in there. Um, this assumes you've got really descriptive naming conventions, but Sitecore does as well. So if it's a Sitecore, uh, you know, if, if there's none of your code in the call stack, but there's a there's a uh, a Sitecore, it's all within Sitecore. You can actually tell which system within Sitecore is, is having a, having an issue. So that that information is uh, definitely valuable in there. So let's look at some common errors. This is one I think everybody's run into. Required license is missing. This is the two two reasons, um, and I think you, you may see it as this one as well. So this is the kind of the pretty version. Of, of the required license is missing. There's two ways you do this. If you're, if you're an end customer of Sitecore, the, the, this first one won't apply to you, but if you're a partner or if you have a temporary license, uh, partner and temporary licenses expire. And so if you are running a, 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 a lot of times, we would run into it with our QA sites. Um, nobody really, we, we got into the habit of when our partner license expired, we put a note on the calendar for like a month ahead of time. So we would go get the new partner license because then all of our QA sites would be down at midnight. Um, or if you have someone like one of my customers, Sitecore gave them a temporary license when they re-upped their license. Um, so they had an existing license. Uh, the Sitecore rep gave them a new license file. They, they, they were licensed, I think, for like only so many domains. They wanted to expand that to another one. And Sitecore gave them a new license. There's no, there's no technical reason why they did that. Well, they deployed that, and then like midnight on March 31st, their entire site went down because the license expired because they had deployed a, a temporary one. Um, that one, I think, you instead of required licenses missing, you'd see the, the license is expired. You'd actually see that in the message. But this most more, more times than not, what causes this is somewhere in your config files, you've changed where your data folder. Because Sitecore is going to go to the data folder and look for license.xml. Um, and more times than not, it's because you deploy files from a different server onto there. Because typically, Sitecore is installed in a different path. The data folder is defined as, you know, it's C, INET pub, www, slash my site, slash website, or slash data. So that's where the, the log file is. And maybe on the production servers, they're on the D drive. And so there's a different data folder definition in that. This one's real really common, it throws people, especially new to Sitecore, and something breaks, all of a sudden they're like, oh my god, what's going on? It's, um, they can't figure out what's going on. Um, so that's one to look at. The other most common one, this is one I just, I, I kind of generated, um, but this, these, these cannot resolve type errors. These are very common. You'll see these a lot if you're trying to install modules, or if you get uh, a Sitecore install and are trying to get it running on, on a server. Um, this basically means Sitecore, if you, if you dig into the config files, Sitecore runs almost completely on reflection. So I don't know if you're not familiar with what .NET reflection is, but instead of all of Sitecore's files being statically linked, so it knows to load Sitecore kernel, it knows, it knows to load uh, Sitecore.nexus and Sitecore.forms, all of that, it actually, all that information is defined in the configuration file, and at runtime, Sitecore reads that file, says, oh, I need, for this pipeline, I need these types. This type lives in this file. So I'm going to dynamically load that at runtime and then invoke that type there. So in this case, I have a type called project, Sitecore utility, super cool function in the assembly my file that project um, that it can't, it can't be loaded. So what the, the best approach on the, in this case is you've got to figure out which config file is causing this. And the challenge is, the, great, the best place to do this would be to just go to show config, uh, which if you're not familiar with that, I think they still cover this on, so Sitecore will take the entire computed configuration and dump it out once my server wakes up. Um, this is, this is the entire configuration. So if it would be great, I could just control F here and find my type. The thing is, more often than not, if you're getting this cannot load type, show config won't even run because you'll still get the same error. Um, so typically what I'll do in that case is I'll use a tool like Notepad++, which has a, has a find in files, um, and try and find the offending config file um, that that's in. Uh, if it's a case of you're just trying to get you're trying to get the site back up, maybe you can comment you can comment those lines out of the config file. Maybe you rename the config file to dot disabled or dot uh, dot old or something like that. So so Sitecore doesn't try and load them to to get Sitecore to load back up. 
Um, I run into this a lot. Uh, the, the, the biggest time I've run into this is typically when you're upgrading Sitecore, and it's not so much for when you're upgrading Sitecore, it's upgrading a lot of the modules. The, the, the biggest offender is web forms for marketers. If you've ever gone through that upgrade process, I have the utmost sympathy for you guys. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is so painful um, because almost every version of web forms for marketers, they make breaking changes. So all of a sudden, if you have an old config file out there, it's trying to load types that don't exist anymore. Um, thankfully, I've heard that Web Forms for Marketers is going away. I, I hope there is a funeral for it in Las Vegas <laughs> at a symposium. Um, and I have heard that they might be announcing its replacement there. I have no, I can't confirm or deny that. But, um, but yeah, this is I mean, typically if you have this can't resolve type, that's the, the best approach is to figure out where that's coming from. You can typically find that type uh, somewhere in your config files. So, so advanced moves. Um, Profiling is a great, a, a really great tool, especially if you're trying to troubleshoot performance issues. Um, dot trace and ants profiler are kind of uh, the the two. Um, they're not inexpensive. Um, I think I just re-upped my license for dot trace, and it was around 500 bucks. Um, but it will attach to uh, IIS. It will run and actually time all the method calls in there. Uh, and then once you detach it, it will run through. Uh, what it profiled and tell you what, what's taking so much time. Um, I just happened to use it um, to identify we're having database issues on a, on a, on a site where you know, none of, the, none of the, the, the calls within Sitecore were that long. It was all the calls to ADO.net that Sitecore makes under the covers to SQL Server. Um, New Relic and App Dynamics is, uh, they're also, they also provide similar information. These are uh, agents that run on your server, and then they ship their information off to uh, a third-party software as a service. Um, I used to really like New Relic. They've kind of changed their pricing model. App Dynamics pretty slick. Uh, this is the first time I've used it in the past um, past couple of weeks. Um, their free trial is pretty nice, and it's 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 more expensive than New Relic, but it seems to offer a lot better information. Uh, App Dynamic, I think, is around 150 bucks a month per server, so it does get pretty pricey. Um, but spinning it up for just uh, uh, to troubleshoot something uh, quickly is, is, is pretty nice. And even in their free tiers, you still get 24 hours worth of data. So you don't have, you don't have months and months worth of data to run analysis on, but you can actually see, uh, you, know, you, you can monitor the, the, the site in real time. And I think the final thing I'd leave on is this is not for the faint of heart, because this is something I was exposed to quite a bit when I was at Microsoft. It's actually doing what's called, what we refer to as post-mortem debugging. Um, this is actually taking a dump of memory off of the server and pulling it down off the server and actually then uh, analyzing it. Um, it's, it's really not for the faint of heart. I have done it a number of times, and every time I do it, I forget all the commands, because this, um, uh, this is a screenshot of WinDBG, which is Locally, it'll refer to as windbag, um, and it's basically you load a, a crash dump of uh, of a process. So it, basically, you can use a tool like Proc Dump. Um, you run it on the server. It pauses the IIS process, writes the entire contents of memory to disk in a format that WinDBG can load, and you can load that up and you can debug it. You can't, you know, set breakpoints and step through code because it's a sh it's a snapshot in time, but you can use it along with another tool called SOS, which I believe is short for Sun of Strike. It was a, it was a tool uh, internally developed at Microsoft and is now shipped with the framework to debug .NET uh, assemblies. Because this tool actually goes way back to like Windows 3.1 timeframes. This is what they internally use to debug, uh, um, internally debug Windows. But you can actually look at what, what's, on the, what's on the call stack. What are, what are all the threads that are in that process doing? What is the call stack of each thread? Um, a lot of times you can see all the, maybe there's a whole bunch of threads waiting on one thread that's waiting on another. So now you're in a deadlock state, and that's why you, you have no more threads to accept the inbound connections. You can also look at, um, you can look at memory contents of the, the, the heap. Um, again, it's, it's, it's pretty advanced and it's beyond the, the, the concept of this, this presentation. But it's, it's definitely something to do. I've, I've been on a call with Sitecore where they've actually taken dumps from um, from a process, stepped through it, stepped through it, um, and we've identified the issues that were occurring in Sitecore. So it's it's kind of the, the last uh, last resort. 
And with that, that's kind of about all I had. It was, I, I know it's kind of a brief overview. I didn't want to get bogged down in, in, in doing a, a, a ton of demos. Um, I'm, if you don't know where to find me, I'm D Dysart on Twitter. I also run a um, uh, semi-weekly, although it's been stretching out into monthly as my client load has gone up. But I run a podcast on, um, uh, focused completely on Psychor. Um, we've got about, what is it, about 20 episodes out now. Um, I'm talking with various people in the Psychor community, folks like yourself, uh, just sitting down. It's, it's less technical demonstration, more just Couple people shoot the breeze about Cyclone. Um, so check it out. Um, the, the Twitter account's Core Sampler. It's coresampler.fm. Um, with that, I'll gladly take any questions. And no, I won't ask them to figure out. I won't troubleshoot. <laughs> 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 so you mentioned at the end there about uh, you know, Cyclone, you know, you're on the phone with them. How do you interact with Cyclone? Where do they plug into this process? And how do you see that working? I will say, so everybody that's a certified developer can, can open a ticket at support.sitecore.net. Um, and I will say the more due diligence you can do on your own of scoping down, uh, this, I've done this, I, we see these errors and these errors, I've checked these values, and when I change this, it now does this, which is also wrong. If you can scope, and this, this is just coming from having to log those tickets with Microsoft of like, if you call in as like, hey, SQL Server doesn't work. Like, so now they're like, okay, now well, well what the, what is, what do you, the more you can define if it doesn't work, the better. And the, the, the faster that those tickets are gonna get handled by Sitecore. <laughs> because Sitecore's, um, you'll typically, you log a ticket, and I'll tell you, if you don't attach it right away, they're gonna ask for uh, a package using the Sitecore support generator. Uh, it's SSPG, the Sitecore support package generator. It's an application you run on the server. It collects all the log files. It collects, uh, I'm trying to think, it takes a snapshot of the config files. It takes, um, you can optionally have it uh, include the, the Windows error logs. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff. It basically will package that all into a zip file and even upload it to Sitecore Support's FTP site and then give you the file name and then you put that in your support ticket that, hey, my SSPG, packages on the FTP server in this directory. Um, I've gotten into the habit now, if I open a ticket, I immediately put that up because I guarantee you if you don't, that's the first thing they're gonna ask you for, is like what is this, can you get us a support package? Uh, and the more information, and this, this is again coming from my experience of working in support, the more information you can get the better, including exact steps of what you did to get, to, that you've done to troubleshoot it. Um, and, that, and that goes for even if you're going to use a community resource, whether you're going to uh, go on the Cycro Slack or if you're going to ask a question on the Cycro Stack Exchange. Um, and this is just this is common general internet etiquette. But if you go on there and show that you've done some due diligence, you've exhausted you, you, you've exhausted you know Google and all these other avenues for finding assistance. And I'm you know I, I've exhausted everything. I'm seeing this. I haven't seen it you're more likely to get help. And that, that's just kind of general, general asking for help, guidance. It's not, you know, it's not particularly uh, apropos to just Cycler. And there's two different levels of support you get in Cycler, right? There's the standard. Mm -hmm. I've only ever dealt with people that have kind of standard support. So it's, yeah, and unfortunately, it's about a 24 hour turnaround for your, your tickets to get, you know, to get taken out. Um, but a lot of those guys are, are really smart. They're really smart um, individuals that, that know Cycle. Right. Anything else? Great, thanks a lot. Yeah.